The Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, and Global Human Rights will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitation in the rules. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the previously mentioned address or contact full committee staff. As a reminder to members, please keep your video function on at all times, even when you are not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, and please remember to mute yourself after you finish speaking. Consistent with HRES 965 and the accompanying regulations, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they are not under recognition to eliminate background noise. I see that a quorum, I see that we have a quorum, and I'll now recognize myself for opening remarks. Pursuant to notice, we are holding a hearing on the effects of climate change in Africa. For years, scientists shared early warnings about the growing threat that could lead to devastating climate change related disasters, and yet many of the world's population have ignored the signs. To be clear, climate change is a national security concern and some of the effects re resulting from it are no longer preventable. The wide range of client impacts are being felt around the world and they are manifesting faster than our efforts to mitigate them. It is reported that the African continent will be hardest hit by climate change because hundreds of millions of people depend on rainfall to grow their food. The climate system in Africa is controlled by a complex mix of large scale weather systems that are vastly understudied. The two most extensive land-based end of century projected decreases in rainfall anywhere on the planet occur in both the North and Southern Africa. And the capacity for adaptation to climate change is low due to circumstances such as extreme poverty affecting individual choices and government failing to prioritize climate change. For example, severe weather events from devastating cyclones and floods in Mozambique, Malawi, and Zimbabwe to the invasion of desert uh, locusts in the Horn and Sahel regions of Africa to longer drought periods, continue to test institutions, individual livelihoods, and local economies. Just last year, the World Meteorological Organization noted that Africa has been warming progressively since the start of the last century. And in the last five years, Northern and Southern Africa are set to get drier and hotter while the Sahel region, region of Western Africa will get wetter. Climate change impacts everyone everywhere, but it is rarely mentioned on a global scale in Africa. That's why my colleagues and I wanna highlight this topic specifically in Africa, and then hear from experts on how to mitigate and partner with African nations to address climate change. Our, subject, our subcommittee also has jurisdiction over global human rights, and under this capacity, I'm personally interested and exploring how climate change is destabilizing many governments and is threatening the human rights of citizens on the continent, including health, food, housing, and the adequate standard of living. I believe a better appreciation for these impacts will allow us to prioritize responses given the competing priorities on the continent. The COVID-19 pandemic brought radical change to the world, and we should seize this opportunity to integrate climate change resilient actions into our recovery plans and foreign assistance. Internal conflict among citizens and against governments can be further fueled by limited resources and unmet needs following drought periods and food and water scarcity. These inequities among groups can be exacerbated by the effects of droughts, floods, and intense storms that ravage farms and livestock production and are increasingly contributing to conflict and migration. Lastly, I want this hearing to provide insights into how climate change can act as a conflict and migration driver. A better understanding of the multifaceted ways of how the climate influences drivers of conflict and migration will help us here in Congress formulate a direct and comprehensive policy to work alongside our African counterparts to mitigate future risk. I'd like to thank our witnesses for participating in this important hearing and the committee is looking forward to hearing your recommendations on how to partner with countries in Africa to address adaptation and mitigation of climate change. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Chris Smith, for the purpose of making his opening statement. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Bass, for holding a, a timely hearing this time on the effects of climate change in Africa. To reiterate a point made during our last hearing on COVID-19, 
Africa is confronted with crisis, compounding crisis, compounding crisis. We examined then how COVID-19 impacted and exacerbated food insecurity, driven in turn by disasters such as the East Africa uh, desert locust crisis and the conflict which we see engulfing Ethiopia's Tigray region. Overlaid upon this is the impact of climate change, which we see affecting people and communities throughout Africa. Heightening competition for resources, impacting food insecurity, and making conflict worse. Look, for example, at Lake Chad, which is shrinking, impacting people in countries at borders, Chad, Niger, Nigeria, Cameroon. Why is there decreased rainfall, which results in less water for the lake uh, and, and its tributaries? Why is the Sahara Desert to the north uh, spreading southward, encroaching upon the lake region? To what extent is this attributable to climate change? As we seek to find solutions, we must keep in mind that combating climate change cannot be an end in and of itself. It must be done in the service of people, and particularly those who are adversely affected by climate change. Thus, as we survey how energy consumption and power generation might impact the environment globally, we should keep in mind that Africa's variable contribution to such problems is negligible. One estimate by Todd Moss, one of our witnesses today, puts it at one half of 1% and that African nations need to assess access to power sources to provide for their people. Any supposed solution which seeks to solve the problem of climate change on the backs of the African people, such as by denying or conditioning their access to power projects or arbitrary or unduly abstract criteria need to be rejected. We must also avoid creating false dilemmas. As one of our witnesses again, Todd points out, uh, as Africa develops its energy capacity, it tends towards clean energy, transitioning away from dirty, heavy fuel oil This is and coal. This largely means development of low carbon natural gas capability combined with alternative energy sources by African nations. As various US development agencies and programs which interact with Africa, USAID, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the International Development Finance Corporation, and the Africa Development Foundation consider projects in Africa it is also important that we do not handcuff development by unduly restricting support for gas projects. Again, the lodestar here must be human dignity and the development of the capacity for human flourishing. Insofar as climate change diminishes that capacity for human flourishing, we must combat it. But in fighting that battle, we cannot destroy the village in order to save it. Our policy decision must strive for a balanced approach, which understands the importance of the environment and in reducing man-made effects on the environment, along with the need to provide for the basic needs of people. We have a great group of witnesses today, and uh, I look forward uh, to their testimony. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Smith. I also want to point out that you were um, early on in recognizing the impact of the locust investigation and did legislation in that regard. So thank you for your leadership in that area. We now wanna to move to our uh, witnesses and I would like to do a round of introduction of everyone and uh, you will have five minutes to speak and hopefully you see the timer that is there. Actually, I don't see it now, I'm not sure where it went. Um, let me first introduce Dr. Esther Ngumbe is an assistant professor of etymology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She was awarded the 2018 Society for Experimental Biology Presidential Award. She has contributed to Mail and the Guardian, The Moth, Scientific America, and the World Economic Forum. She is a Mandela Washington Fellowship for YALI, for the Young African Leaders uh, uh, Project, and mentors young researchers through the Clinton Foundation. She received her BA and MA from Kenyatta University and her PhD from Auburn University. Dante Desparte is the founder and chairman of Risk Cooperative, a strategic risk advisory and insurance brokerage based in DC. He also serves as an appointee of FEMA's National Advisory Council and is the founder of the Business Council for American Security with the nonpartisan America Security Project. He is the chief security, chief strategy officer and head of global policies. Um, Hold on a second. 
he, he is the chief, yes, and is a leading digital financial services firm building a treasury and payments infrastructure for the internet, including the fastest growing dollar digital currency. Mr. Desparte is a graduate of Harvard Business School and holds a MS in risk management, risk management from NYU. Catlin Walsh is the director of the Global Food Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where she provides insights and policy solutions to global and US food security challenges. She previously served in the National Security Council, the National Economic Council as a director of global economic engagement where she coordinated US policy in the G7 and G20. Prior to the White House, Ms. Wilsh Will spent over seven years in the Department of State's Office of Global Food Security, including, including as acting director, offering guidance to the Secretary of State on global food security and its relationship to urbanization, climate change, and conflict. She received her BA from the University of Virginia and MPA from Columbia University. Dr. Todd Moss, is the executive director for the Energy for Growth Hub, a nonprofit global research network dedicated to high energy future for everyone. He is also a non-resident fellow at the Center for Energy Study at Rice University's Baker Institute, the Payne Institute at the Colorado School of Mines, and the Center for Global Development. Dr. Moss previously served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State and has worked at Georgetown and the World Bank. He is the author of African Development, making sense of issues and actors, as well as oil to cash, fighting the resource curse with cash transfers. He received his PhD from the University of London. I wanna welcome our guests again, and would like to ask that you submit your full testimony to the committee, but that you summarize your remarks uh, in five minutes, and I believe that you see the clock. Uh, Dr. Ngumbe. Thank you, Chairman, Chairwoman Abbas, Ranking Member Smith, and all the subcommittee members for the humbling opportunity to speak a topic that is important climate change and its effects to Africa, a continent that I call my own. I grew up in the farming community in the, on the Kenyan coast. Back then, the rains were predictable. The soil was healthy, the heat was mild. But as I was growing up, I began to witness gradual changes in weather and seasons, which disrupted the growth cycles of our food. I saw how halfway through the growing seasons, insects would come and eat all our food. And what insects hadn't taken away, trout would. Other years, after several months of drought and extreme temperatures, the rains would return. And instead of helping our plants grow, it would wash them away, which meant we were hungry and poor. I now live in the US. And in 2016 and 2018, I visited Kenya, my motherland, and saw firsthand the continued consequences of climate change, from failed rains to droughts and extreme temperatures, withered crops, food insecurity. And last month, I had a communication with my family and farmers who are participating on a field day at our farm on the Kenyan coast. The rains had not yet arrived because of extreme heat all our crops had withered. People were hungry. A sense of hopelessness was looming. My family and community is not alone. Because of climate change, millions of African citizens whom depend on agriculture as a source of livelihood are hungry, poor, insecure, food insecure, and displaced tens of millions of African citizens have been driven away from their homes because of floods, storms, intense cyclones, and droughts. Sadly, these members are not only suffering from the tragic uh, consequences of climate change, we know that the world's poorest are the most vulnerable. 
Already in 2021, flooding events have damaged homes, displaced communities, and killed African citizens from Angola to Zimbabwe. But if it's not flooding, then it's usually drought that's harming members of the African continent. Repetitive and vicious cycles of drought and famines have become way too common. As a result, millions of African citizens are living in abject poverty. Millions have been forced to migrate and along the migration path, women and girls are often raped, leaving lifelong scars that are hard to erase. Then what drought hasn't taken away, crop eating invasive insect pests often take. For instance, East Africa is still recovering from a plague of locust. Before the locust, was the fall armyworm, which affected over 44 African countries. I am an entomologist, and science predicts a future where insect invasions will become common because of climate change. And while the effects of climate change have become enormous, we must applaud African countries because they've not walked away. They consider climate change a crisis, a threat, and boldly have stepped up to cut down the greenhouse emissions and address the climate change crisis. African countries are members of the international climate agreements, including 2016 Paris Climate Accord, and have fulfilled all and most of the critical requirements that are required. Many are prioritizing climate proofing and development uh, activities in critical sectors such as agriculture and energy. The truth, however, is that African leaders cannot do it alone, and nor should they. The US must step up and help. Thank you. Here's how. First, the U.S. must cut down its greenhouse emissions and continue treating climate change as an essential element of U.S. foreign policy, national security. Thank you, Dr. Lume. We'll be able to come back to you during the uh, Q&A time. Uh, I'd now like to go to our next witness, Ms. Walsh. Welsh. Thank you very much. Chairwoman Bass, Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Following is a summary of my written testimony, which I have submitted to the committee. Two narratives dominate reports of climate impacts on food security in Africa. First, that climate-related weather events suppress farmers' yields. And second, that climate change contributes to violent conflict in certain hotspots. These narratives are true, but incomplete. In fact, climate change affects food security for all Africans through many pathways, with implications for U.S. foreign policy, development programming, and national security. In its most recent report, the U.N. estimates that about 19% of Africans were undernourished in 2019. That's the highest prevalence of undernourishment worldwide. And the U.N. also estimates that healthy diets, diets that meet all nutrient requirements, and help prevent malnutrition in all its forms are least affordable in Africa. These data represent food security through 2019, not yet reflecting the severe impacts of COVID-19. On the impacts of climate change on agricultural yields, in Africa today, climate change affects all agricultural sectors. In the past 60 years, agricultural yields have declined by one third across the continent due to climate change. These declines result from changes to non-living systems like precipitation and temperature, and living systems like plant diseases and pests, like the recent desert locust plague in East and North Africa. Climate change also affects livestock production, as in the Sahel, where competition over water forces herders to move to seek new grazing land. Climate change also is also affecting forestry. In Ethiopia, the chance of a significant drop in coffee production could increase by over 30% by 2030. And finally, climate change is affecting fisheries. 
Due to sea rising sea temperatures and ocean acidification, fish stocks could fall by up to 60% in the Gulf of Guinea by 2050. Agricultural yield declines are important because they reduce the amount of nutritious food available for consumption and because they threaten agriculture-based livelihoods. In Africa, climate change and food insecurity can be part of, a, part of a complex system of disruptors also involving migration and violent conflict. Migration can be an adaptation strategy leading to better outcomes or a push factor for displacement as we see with the 2.7 million people displaced in the Lake Chad Basin today. On conflict, in its 2021 annual threat assessment released earlier this month, the US intelligence community states, and this is a paraphrased quote, the degradation and depletion of natural resources almost certainly will threaten infrastructure, health, water, food, and security in many developing countries and increase the potential for conflict, end quote. But by no means are food producers the only food insecure population in Africa. New studies of the impact of climate change on malnutrition have found indistinguishable impacts on children in urban and rural areas. UNICEF names climate change a direct cause of malnutrition among children and states, quote, due to the concentration of children in urban areas and their level of vulnerability, children will bear the heaviest impacts, end quote. COVID-19 is further stressing food insecurity in cities. The International Food Policy Research Institute estimates that because of the pandemic, poverty will increase by 15% in rural areas, but by 44% in urban areas in Sub-Saharan Africa. So to conclude, the impacts of climate change on food security are complex and present challenges and opportunities for policymakers. For example, the US Global Food Security Strategy expires this year. Led by USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, departments and agencies are revising this strategy, which could take a more holistic approach to food security as it is affected by climate change in the ways I have described. USAID's new Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance integrates climate change adaptation and mitigation into existing programming and could make these explicit in an overarching strategy for humanitarian response. Departments and agencies are already showing ambition in their climate-related programming in response to President Biden's January 27th executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad and last week's leader summit on climate. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Desparte. Chairwoman Bass, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony today. I'm the founder and chairman of Risk Cooperative, a firm specialized in risk insurance and resilience. I also serve on FEMA's National Advisory Council and as a chief strategy officer and head of global policy for Circle, a leading provider of digital financial services. I've dedicated my career to making the world more resilient at the nexus of global security, emerging risks, and technology, including my ongoing work with leading nonpartisan think tanks and institutions such as the American Security Project, New America Foundation, and the Brookings Institution. I'm speaking today in my personal capacity to address the important questions raised by the subcommittee on the effects of climate change in Africa. To begin, I want to acknowledge that like the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic, where in effect we're as strong as the weakest links, Climate change poses a similarly urgent challenge requiring coordinated global action and solidarity. For the world to rise to the occasion of arresting the spread of COVID-19 and responding to climate change, US leadership is a necessity. Indeed, we could draw close parallels between pandemic preparedness and mounting a concerted response to climate change, particularly as it affects vulnerable populations and developing and emerging countries disproportionately. I'm no stranger to Africa. Having run business operations in 32 African countries earlier in my career while working in the humanitarian supply chain. I've also worked over the years to catalyze inward investment flows and entrepreneurialism across the continent, including as an advisor to Tony Lumello's entrepreneurship program and to various programs led by the State Department and the World Bank Group. I'm also no stranger to the long-term effects of disaster displacement, having grown up poor in Puerto Rico's paradise, where my house was destroyed by Hurricane Hugo as a kid, and my island destroyed by Hurricane Maria as an adult. If the fate of Caribbean islands and small island states are the veritable canaries in the climate change coal mine, then the future of building climate-smart adaptation and resilience may very well be told on the African continent. 
home to one of the first countries to recognize U.S. independence in 1777, the Kingdom of Morocco. In 2015, I was in, invited to be a part of President Obama's delegation to the Global Entrepreneurship Summit in Kenya, where youth and talent are Africa's most abundant resource, followed closely by the sun. These need to be harnessed to ensure climate-smart economic development and broad-based economic participation. While part of my testimony today will outline some of the threats and concerns that should shape U.S. foreign policy and national security objectives, the best instrument we have to combat the deleterious effects of climate change in Africa and here at home is to innovate our way through the crisis, build deep commercial ties, destigmatize investments south of the Mediterranean, and leverage widely underutilized risk transfer instruments that can put a fixed price on risk and uncertainty. Some of these policy considerations are in my written testimony. For now, let me outline some of the specific risk factors we must, we must consider. Economic and insurance impacts, spurring broad-based climate-smart economic activity across Africa requires accelerating investments, trade, and commercial linkages, as well as bridging a yawning insurance gap. Infectious and vector-borne diseases, beginning with combating the effects of COVID-19, climate change will continue to exacerbate the risk of novel zoonotic or vector-borne diseases with pandemic potential will emerge in Africa. Human displacement and mass migration. The growth of climate change refugees, human displacement and mass migration across Africa continues as a destabilizing trend. Local, regional and international security. The linkage between resource scarcity with growing resource nationalism conspires with the rising specter of terrorism and militancy across Africa. Climate change will compound these risks and the risk of likelihood of spillover. Energy security. You can have electricity without economic growth, but you cannot have economic growth without electricity. Investing in bridging the gap in renewable energy access, affordability, and grid resilience can power Africa and U.S. economic competitiveness in lockstep. With this summary of my written testimony, I look forward to addressing your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Moss. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Chair Bass, Ranking Member Smith, and other members of the subcommittee. Uh, I've worked on U.S. Africa policy and development for three decades. Uh, I proudly served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, and I now run the Energy for Growth Hub, a nonprofit dedicated to using data and evidence to build a world where no person's potential is wasted because the electricity is too unreliable or too uh, unaffordable where they live and work. Uh, I interact nearly every day with African researchers and policymakers at the nexus of climate and energy policy. And those perspectives have greatly affected um, and shaped my views that you'll hear today. The dual fights against poverty and climate change are even more urgent with the pandemic exposing unacceptable levels of global inequality. And we, the United States, have to get this right if we ever possibly hope to provide an alternative to the influence of China or Russia. With rising attention to global inequality, racial injustice, and mounting frustration at vaccine nationalism, Africa must get fair treatment in climate policy. All nations must get to net zero, but that drive must start from the first principle of economic justice. I have three points uh, today. One, climate justice starts with a basic fact Africa contributes the least to causing climate change. Uh, as as uh, Member Smith mentioned, cumulative CO2 from more than 1 billion people living in 48 African countries accounts for 0.5% of the total. Energy inequality is so great that Americans use more electricity playing video games than the entire nation of Nigeria. Now, mitigating emissions is urgent, but Africa is not where that battle will be won or lost. Point two, African nations are already leading in the transition to a clean energy future, but every country still has the right to determine its own path to net zero. African countries are not the same as the United States and our paths will not be the same. I want to especially highlight that South Africa is not representative of the rest of the continent. South Africa must decarbonize a very high energy economy that's coal dependent and demand is flat. Nearly every other country on the continent is the opposite. They're low energy, low carbon, and their demand is exploding. For example, Senegal aims to use a mix of solar, wind, and domestic gas in order to expand electricity to all citizens 
to transition away from uh, dirty heavy fuel oil and to power its industry. Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, and every other country have their own plans for different technology mixes of hydro, solar, wind, gas, and geothermal to provide power for their people and for their economies. Point three is US policy to accelerate the clean energy transition absolutely cannot come at the expense of Africa's own development goals. Like us, the immediate priority is usually job creation. 12 million young people enter Africa's labor markets each year and they face staggering unemployment. To create jobs, Africa needs a lot more energy. And I wanna just flag two common mistakes we should be very careful to avoid. One is unrealistic expectations of leapfrogging. Yes, many countries should and will exploit cheap solar and wind. And yes, new off-grid solar systems can deliver some energy services to certain populations. But no modern economy can yet run competitively on intermittent renewables alone. We can't do it here, and we can't ask Africans to wait for jobs and development until storage costs come way down. The second mistake is allowing misplaced fears of coal to justify a blanket ban on all fossil fuels. Outside of South Africa, coal is largely irrelevant on the continent. In fact, virtually no new coal will come online uh, um, in the future. Gas, however, is a very different story. Several African countries have their own gas, which they intend not just to export, but also to use at home for industry, cleaner cooking, and to balance intermittent wind and solar. Fortunately, <clears throat> gas in Africa is not a threat to the global carbon budget. In an extreme and entirely implausible scenario, if Africa tripled its electricity consumption entirely using natural gas, and nobody's proposing this, the additional global CO2 would be one, it would be equivalent to 1%. So to conclude, I urge Congress to support the administration's pledges to scale up support for low carbon energy, and especially to invest in R&D for new energy technology. But Congress should also hold the administration accountable for its climate adaptation pledges. It should encourage the administration to be flexible by avoiding blunt rules on gas that would limit choices for low emission, energy poor countries in Africa. This includes rules at DFC, MCC, USAID, and using our voice at the World Bank. And most importantly, we have to listen to African leaders. U.S. policies will be most effective when they support Africans' own climate, job creation, and industrialization goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me take this opportunity again to thank all of our witnesses. So we will now question witnesses under the five-minute rule beginning, uh, I will begin, uh, followed by the ranking member, and then we will alternate uh, Dems and Republicans. Um, so I, uh, I always am interested in what ideas we can take from this hearing to create legislation that will help move the ball forward. So that's the perspective I, I, I want to bring to this. And I want to ask if you might, uh, any one of you that want to uh, respond to this, might want to um, point out any gaps in programming or resources that, uh, that the United States is currently doing? Where do you think we need to target resources and programming at this point? Um, I'm also gonna ask about migration from the EU uh, and I would want you to respond to that. So could I ask, let me start with Dr. Ngumbe, if you wanna respond to that. Where do you see the gaps in US programming? Resource. Thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman uh, Bass. First of all, yes, without a, a resilient African agriculture uh, system, any effort in climate change will fail. So that must be a priority for the United States. And one of the most important step way is uh, through a uh, the U.S. Aid uh, Feed the Future initiatives. These are partnerships uh, that uh, collaborate, African universities collaborate with uh, U.S. There must be funding that is going to fund research because science will, must lead the way from invasive pests, from uh, plant diseases. We must uh, collaboratively work together to address uh, this uh, 
emerging and that will continue issues that will continue to uh, grow. And then I also look at thinking about satellites using uh, the United States NASA data to ensure that Africans are able to predict, prepare, and anticipate, and not to be caught unawares because we know we have the tools. Why okay. are we not funding that? L let me ask you another question. I wanted to know the status of the African Union strategy on climate change. Um, it's my understanding that it remains in, dra in draft form, and I want to know if that's the case or has it been finalized? They're still working on it, and but I think also African countries must also continue to be pushed to uh, have very concrete and actionable items. Climate crisis is, is a crisis of our times. And I Thank think up the United States must push through uh, the US government. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Moss, I wanted to know if you can comment about the um, cause of migration, especially from African countries to the EU, and it's specific, if you could give a couple of specific examples. Uh, thank you, Chair. That is, that's not an area of my expertise. Um, so I, I prefer, maybe I could comment on your question about, about what Congress could do to support uh, resource allocation. That's fine. I think a very, if, if that's okay with permission, I think it's very important that the Power Africa Initiative, which was launched by, by President Obama and with very broad bipartisan support, that con congressional support for that initiative uh, stays. Um, that has been a hugely successful initiative in doing two things, in catalyzing uh, private capital into the African power sector. They've shown that that will work. Um, and that the US government can do that successfully. It's also shown that a coordinator can actually make the interagency work together. Um, and that is actually pretty rare these, these days. So building on Power Africa, there are ways that it could be even bigger and better, and that would, would require continued bipartisan support from Congress. They've been very good at getting generation and connections. The next step for Power Africa is actually reliability and driving costs down because that's what's going to turn electricity into jobs. The other is the, the new bottlenecks. It used to be we couldn't get capital into wind farms and solar farms. That's no longer true. Power Africa has shown those projects can be made bankable and the capital will come. The bottleneck in, in a lot of countries, including Kenya, is, is now the transmission networks uh, and storage. So there's only so much wind and solar you can put into these systems until they really start to, to uh, destabilize. Kenya is definitely at that point and a lot of other countries. Thank so it you, would Dr. be very important for Power Africa to move into these other areas. Good. And then in my Thank last you. few uh, seconds, uh, Dr. Desparte, would you like to comment on that on the migration? Yes, I mean, I think, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Bass. I think one of the major points to highlight is the connectivity between the African diaspora in the United States and the African continent. The world's most important cash flow is for, uh, sorry, is is peer to peer remittances. It's a $700 billion cash flow here in Washington, D.C. in this area. We have the largest Ethiopian diaspora. And yet when we think about the cost, the time, and particularly in the context of a pandemic, um, the difficulty of picking up remittance transfers uh, at physical locations. I think there are really tremendous opportunities for the United States to revisit how to lower these costs and how not to penalize an entire continent for fear of one person making an errant transaction. So some upgrades to a lot of the global financial crimes compliance rules can start to de-risk these cash flows. And I think some of the points that Dr. Todd raised about de-risking um, investment flows into specific energy sectors and other sectors can also leverage a lot more um, of the private insurance markets, but also a lot of the instruments we have through multilaterals and through our development finance institutions. Thank you. Uh, out of time, let me turn to my ranking member, Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Let me, uh, great comments and, and, and insights, and we, do, we all appreciate it. Uh, I would ask um, Ms. Um, Welsh, you pointed out the undernourishment um, at 19%, 250 million currently in Africa. Then you make a very, you know, exciting the United Nations estimates that the number uh, will skyrocket between now and 2030 to 25.7% and 433 million undernourished people 
uh, by 2030. And I'm wondering, you know, what does that take into account um, all of these efforts that are being made to increase output uh, agricultural wise? You also point out that many Africans have moved out of the uh, their livelihoods from ag to to uh, moving to the cities from 63 to 53 percent over 30 years. And I'm wondering, is that crop failure? Is it the inability to make a decent living? Is it modernization that's making those farms uh, more uh, efficient uh, or, or what? Or is it climate change or what, what is uh, causing that huge, huge flow of people? Uh, let me also point out, and um, you know, uh, I've introduced a bill, um, it's known as the Desert Locust Control Act. Uh, thankfully, my good friend and colleague, Karen Bass has co-sponsored it. It's out of committee waiting for floor action, uh, but it would try to address with a comprehensive strategy uh, this this terrible uh, desert locust outbreak that we've seen, it's coming back. Uh, and we need to coordinate better, anticipate better uh, than we have in the past. And um, so hopefully that legislation will be passed. But you, again, um, as well, she really went into some great depth, I thought, uh, on how two pests have caused considerable damage in Africa, where whose destructiveness is linked to climate change. And you talk about the army worm and the desert locust, and you might want to speak uh, to that as well. Let me also ask, because um, we don't have much time, um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Todd uh, uh, Moss, you talked about, and you know, your your point being that coal is not an issue that is likely uh, to be of any consequence in Sub-Saharan Africa, except for South Africa, uh, and that gas, uh, as you pointed out, you know, if it, it tripled uh, their capability overnight, it still would be about one percent. And I thought your point was made very, very well when you said Africa's immediate priority is job creation, especially for the 12 million young Africans who enter the labor market every year and face staggering levels of unemployment. Um, you know, again, the victim in terms of the globe is Africa. Uh, they haven't contributed to this mess. It has been made by other countries. So I, I'm wondering, you know, is, is there enough flexibility? And I thank you for bringing up Power Africa because all of us were enthusiastic supporters uh, of the 2013 uh, Obama Power Africa. And the, the, Electri the Electrify Africa Act was totally bipartisan. Uh, and it does put an emphasis on uh, you know, uh, clean energy, but it also puts an emphasis on making sure that they get the energy needs that they need met. So if you could speak to that. Uh, maybe okay, thank you. Thank you, Representative Smith. I hope you don't mind if I start. Um, I'd also like to I'd like to thank you for your questions and also thank you for your long leadership on these issues. Um, recognizing we have short time, I'll try to give brief answers to allow time for Dr. Moss as well. On your first question on the UN's estimates of food insecurity in Africa by 2030, because those estimates were done before, before COVID, those estimates likely do take into account projections for increased agri agricultural productivity. They don't take into account the impacts of COVID. So in this year's report, which should be out this summer, um, if they do update their estimate for food insecurity by 2030, I'm actually expecting that, it, that, that it, it, it might be worse than what last year's report showed because of the impacts of COVID. I also want to point out that increasing agricultural productivity might not necessarily improve food security and, and point back to the first ever and only ever intelligence community assessment on global food security released in 2015. One of the top line findings of that was that increasing the amount of food available worldwide will not necessarily lead to global food security, simply because so many more elements must be in place for people to be food secure. Um, on your question about um, rates of urbanization in African countries, I think it's really important to recognize that rural populations decline and urban populations de increase when farming is productive and when it's not productive. When it's productive, you need less labor on farms. When it's not productive, people seek employment elsewhere. So I think one, one mistake the community can make is that um, is assuming that, that if we keep the people on farms in rural areas, then you know, that, that in and of itself is the solution. Um, and I will turn uh, my remaining time over to, to Dr. Moss. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you, Representative Smith for that question. Um, yes, you know, you're right. Africa is, it's not, it isn't the culprit, it's the victim of climate change. And that has to be the starting point um, we would expect uh, emissions in Africa, which are crazy low, right? So the average American emits 40 times what the average Kenyan does. We, we would expect, and we in some ways should welcome rising emissions in Africa because people are moving 
from low productivity, maybe in farms, they're moving into cities, they're buying um, modern appliances, they're, they're using data centers and computers and all of the things of modern living in a modern economy. And that requires a lot more energy and it does require more emissions um, until we're able to decarbonize industry, transportation and other sectors. Um, and I also think for the, for the purposes of this hearing, climate adaptation is going to be incredibly energy intensive. Africa will need more energy, not less. If we think of rising temperatures, that means air conditioning and cold storage. If we, if we are worried about uh, extreme weather and hurricanes, that is gonna be infrastructure built with cement and steel. Cement and steel are also hugely energy intensive. And if we're worried about drought, desalination is go going to be part of the solution for some countries. Again, very, very energy intensive. That's why more energy is going to be part of the climate solution for Africa. Thank you, Doug. Let me now call on Representative Barra. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a, a, a great topic and, and super important. And let me um, perhaps ask my first question to, to Ms. Um, Welsh. You know, I'm, you know, when I look at the issue and I'm more familiar with, you know, food insecurity in, in the Indian subcontinent and looking at some of that. But, but I would imagine there, there's a similar case, you know, what's astounding in India is the amount of food that actually goes to waste for lack of um, storage. You know, Dr. Moss talked about cold storage, but also the lack of supply chains and the, the ability to move goods to market in a, an efficient way. And, and I'd be curious if that's certainly the, the, the case in, in Africa and how we might think about approaching that and, supporting um, both the, the storage issue as well as you know, building the, those supply chains to get goods to market. Great, thank you so much, I mean, uh, Representative Bear, for that great question. Um, on the topic of food loss and waste, that is a major challenge around the world. Um, it's important to note that in the developed world, the problem exists mainly between markets and homes in the form of food waste. So food that we purchase in stores or restaurants that we don't consume. In low and middle income countries, the problem exists um, uh, before market. So that's when food is lost um, on the farm, uh, between farm, in, in process of transportation, et cetera. Uh, one of the main reasons can be because of uh, lack of storage facilities, cold storage, for example. Um, so I uh, just want to point out that across the African continent, the problem exists mainly in the, in the form of food, food loss, not necessarily food waste. Um, but on that point, um, that relates to a couple of things. One is that, um, as I mentioned in my testimony, the cost of healthy diets um, the average form of a, a, sorry, the cheapest healthy diet is actually the most expensive across Africa. One of the, the reasons is because the foods that are most nutritious tend to be the ones that can spoil fastest, fruits, vegetables, dairy, meats, etc. So actually um, improving cold storage will result in both less food waste and also, um, sorry, less food loss uh, and also improved nutrition outcomes. Great. And I know at my home institution here at UC Davis, you know, with Ag School, they're working on you know, solutions that you can take to villages and, and you know, that are low cost um, and not so energy intensive as well to improve cold storage. Um, Dr. Moss, um, you know, as we think about you know, modernizing um, energy in, in Africa, and you know, I sometimes think about it in the context of, you know, we would never build telecommunication systems the, the way we have. And if we think about the developing world, they jump straight to wireless communications and cellular technology. And if we think about uh, electricity in, in, in that fashion, um, is that the correct way to think about it? And again, don't build an electrical grid like we built in the United States. Um, build what makes sense in the 21st century in, in terms of capacity. And that to me seems more like microgrid building around villages and, and communities and, and as opposed to trying to power the entire country, power communities based on the assets that are that are there so yeah that that's it's an excellent question you know um i do think that, that african countries are not going to do it exactly how we did it uh, nor should they um it's going to be a mix of solutions and there's a very very important role for off-grid solutions absolutely especially for reaching very remote customers or small businesses that are far from the grid um, th those are absolutely uh, um, helpful solutions and they're going to get cheaper and better and they're going to be more uh, reliant. But, but we, 
you know, for cities, for industrial, uh, industrial zones, we're still going to need big infrastructure and to exploit the scale for large scale solar and large scale wind, which Africa has a ton of potential, that's again going to require uh, a, a a flexible functional grid, um, which no country uh, on the continent right now has. Um, so I kind of think of off-grid solar like e-bikes. You know, they're getting better and cheaper and they're great for getting around the neighborhood. They're even maybe good for short commutes, but um, e-bikes are not gonna replace long haul trucks or planes or container ships. There's different transportation solutions for different things we need and energy is like that too. Um, so off-grid solar is going to be really important um, for certain things, but it's not going to be everything. And then maybe just a, a last quick question for you, Dr. Moss. Um, in terms of biofuels, you know, certainly we've seen some technology here where you take your bio waste and et cetera and turn that into to fuel. Has that technology come down to a price point where you could get it out to villages and smaller communities? So I haven't seen small scale bi biomass models that look particularly um, cost competitive right now. If you go to villages, unfortunately, you're still mostly seeing diesel generators because that's what is still the preferred um, uh, model. That's what we want to replace because that's dirty, expensive. It's terrible for lots of reasons. We are seeing some large scale waste to power. Um, Accra, uh, the capital of Ghana, has a, a waste to power facility. And I think as that technology improves, we'll see more of that. Great, and I, I will yield back, I'm out of time. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Jacobs. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our presenters. Um, Ms. Walsh, I was uh, hoping you could drill down a little bit more on something you mentioned in your testimony, which is this question of climate change and conflict. And in particular, I was hoping you could discuss the various effects of climate change that have led to conflict and violence and what patterns and trends we have found specifically in Africa so that we can learn from these patterns as we're trying to mitigate impacts and prevent conflict from breaking out in the future. Thank you, Representative Jacobs. I'm happy to speak to this question as it relates to food security, but would um, welcome opinions from other witnesses and I'm happy to follow up uh, as well in writing. Um, when it comes to relationships between conflict and climate change in Africa, um, often, as I mentioned in my testimony, it's loss of livelihoods um, that, uh, or, or competition for resources that could um, could result in loss of livelihoods that um, that, that will lead to conditions that um, are conducive to conflict. Um, food insecurity is never um, the only or the main reason behind conflict. Um, likewise, with 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 climate change, there's always a you know a, a complex system. Um, there's a, uh, a very strong overlap between places, though, where we're seeing high incidence of food security and high, high incidence of conflict, um, including many of the places termed hot spots, um, most recently by the World Food Program and, and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, from the Central Sahel to Northeast Nigeria to South Sudan, um, across the continent. Um, again, you're seeing a complex relationship um, among these factors, um, but again, they're, they're, they're contributing factors. Um, other factors that are often in play are very low levels of security, which is what we're seeing in the Central Sahel, for example. Um, um, so I uh, stop there, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, would any of the other uh, presenters wanna weigh in on this question? Sure, thank you, um, Representative Jacobs. So I think that the nexus of climate change and conflict is of course very linear and it, it starts at the highest level in the potential for nation state conflict over resources. We're seeing tensions along the Nile River Basin um, for just access to waterways and, and inland waterways as well around the Great Lakes region. And then the, the other challenge, of course, is that it, as you see more and more people displaced and you see uh, groups uh, from Boko Haram in Nigeria to a range of others across the continent start to exploit this concept of protection uh, and of protecting the land that is arable or protecting the land where the agriculture may be grown, um, they're also able to sort of pull in more people into whatever cause they may have. So the, the, there's a direct connection across um, the spectrum of conflict from nation state down to non-state actors, um, terrorism, and, and all of these other um, issues are linked. And, and perhaps the best way to describe it is climate change is the risk of risks. It will amplify every other vulnerability, structural or otherwise, that you face in Sub-Saharan Africa and Africa more generally. Um, and this, this is a place where you could also draw close comparisons to the global experience with COVID-19. Didn't break the systems, but it demonstrated which ones were vulnerable in the first place. 
Great. And Bill, if uh, I may uh, also add something, Chairwoman Bess, uh, I think, yeah, like every uh, witness has said, particularly when you live uh, in uh, farming on a less than an acre, and with climate change, we know that the rains and and droughts and that um, lack of just uh, all the things that you need to grow your food. And without growing food, then there's food insecurity and uh, families, even uh, within this uh, extended families start to fight. I, I remember the Kenyan coast 1997, and I grew up in the Kenyan coast. And because of just poverty, we saw families start to even fight uh, other families. For example, I, I am a Kamba and the Kenyan coast is made of rigid candles and we were being uh, forced to leave. Why? Because uh, people want to protect their resources. And so there's such a linkage between failing agriculture with uh, violence, with conflict, and also failing resources, the lack of healthy soils, soils and with no sense of hope, then you have nothing to lose. And I've had even young people, I've seen young people as they migrate to the, to the urban communities and realize there's no way to even make a way of living. They result into violence. So unless we are able to build strong agricultural sectors, where we also curb the movement from uh, the rural areas to the urban areas, then we are not going to truly have sustainable solutions to climate change and to conflicts and uh, other violence that I've also witnessed growing up in the Kenyan coast. And it's ugly and no one should experience that. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yield thank back. You. Representative Jacobs. Now to Representative Sislini. Thank you, Chairwoman Bass, and thank you to our witnesses for your really important testimony. I want to begin, Dr. Gumbe, with you. In your written testimony, you speak about the importance of modernizing African uh, agriculture, that sector in particular, particularly hard hit, obviously, by climate change. And what can we do as the United States to um, ensure that improved irrigation and better roads and improved soil systems and better crop storage facilities uh, help to keep the continent better protected from the impacts of climate change. Thank you very much for such an important question. Yes, uh, as I keep on stressing, agricultural sector supports over 70% of Africans. And yet uh, only 4% of African land is irrigated. And when you are only dependent on rain-fed agriculture, we now know the science is clear, the rains are unpredictable. There's no way you can grow food. So there must be critical investments. President Biden uh, promised 5.7 billion. First of all, upgrading infrastructure must begin and begin at uh, ensuring that the communities can uh, have dams where they can store their water and we can upgrade the farm so that they can be able to irrigate. If you are able to irrigate, then 24, uh, 365 days, you can grow food. When Africans are able to securely provide food for their families, then we can also now actually have all the time to innovate. And innovations, we must uh, continue to look into science and be guided by science. I, I, am, I live in Illinois right now. It's so much uh, during the growing season, corn is growing and this, even when the climate isn't uh, cooperating, we have yeah. the facilities. So we should ensure that African farmers have those critical, essential, tools and climate smart agriculture. Right now, the US the USDA is working towards also encouraging American farmers. So why don't we work together with Africans and allow Africans to learn and build these climate smart agriculture technologies all along, innovating and also building the capacity so that Africans can take the center of these initiatives. Thank you. Mr. Desparte, um, you speak a lot in your written testimony about human displacement and mass migration, and you describe that it produces 
the worst of humanity. Could you speak a little bit about what the implications are for the continent as a result of those direct effects of climate? And then, uh, so my time won't run out, you mentioned that uh, the continent is a, a climate victim, and I think that we all agree. Um, I know uh, Africa contributes the least to the global emissions causing climate change, but has developed some leading solutions to get to net zero. Are there some specific examples from the continent that you think should be replicated elsewhere, or that the United States could help amplify kind of what things are being done particularly well? So I want to ask those two questions of you and give you the balance of my time to answer. Thank you, Representative Cicilline. These are important questions. And as I'd mentioned in my written testimony, the worst of humanity are issues like um, continued modern slavery, uh, sex trafficking, uh, tra export of, of transnational terrorism, the spread of vector-borne diseases. All of these issues um, thrive in darkness and thrive under the types of conditions that uh, today's um, hearing has aired. And then it also conspires to build some other challenges, right? We live in a world where 1 billion people uh, have no form of um, nationally or internationally acceptable identification. So when you're displaced, you're pushed further into the shadows and further into the margins of the global financial system for which something so simple as having an identity and being able to evidence it is your, is your base layer into entering the bottom rung of economic mobility. So there's some, you know, real long-term, you know, insidious effects of, of this ongoing work. And we're pushing by, by no choice of, of uh, many of the people in Africa, we're pushing them into um, alternative pathways, whether it's piracy on the Horn of Africa, terrorism, child trafficking, human trafficking, all the rest. And so much of the consequences of the European migration crisis are born from these types of issues. Um, so, so we have to be very mindful of that, even as we have our own challenge at the southern border of the United States, we have to be mindful uh, of, of what are all of the whole society approaches we can have here. Um, herein, I'm optimistic. I'm an entrepreneur at the end of the day. And I do think there are a range of policies, technologies, and coalitions that have to be formed, all of which require US leadership in which you could start to address these issues. And as far as energy security is concerned, um, a lot of the points that Dr. Moss raised, there is no one size fits all approach to energy security, but the idea that you can't innovate nor can you mobilize capital south of the Mediterranean for lack of insurance instruments and these types of instruments, these are the most underutilized financial innovations we have. We have an insurance gap domestically in the United States, and we have a yawning insurance gap in Africa. I think identifying ways of bridging that gap can help mobilize capital and catalyze uh, a U.S. Africa investment corridor, which is one of the points I raised in my uh, written testimony. Thank you. Yield Thank back you. Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, what I want to do now, because we have completed the first round of questions, is to enter a second round. Uh, I have a few questions I'll ask. I'll go to the ranking member and then any other members that want to continue on and ask questions, we can continue on for about another 10 uh, minutes or so. Uh, I want to go back to uh, Dr. Moss pointed out something that I want uh, Mr. Desparte to respond to, and that is um, he mentioned uh, transmission and reliability uh, as two things that are really missing. He talked about power Africa. You have mentioned a couple of times insurance gaps uh, on the continent. I want to know what is the solution that the U.S. can do uh, and what type of legislation should we have to address these specific areas? We do have the DFC. How can that be, be used? And so if you could respond to that, I would appreciate it. Mr. Desparte. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Bass. Um, so indeed, we, we do have this, this sort of series of underutilized instruments, uh, both at the public level, at the multilateral level, like the uh, uh, MEGA at the World Bank Group, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Organization. What I find in my experience of having ensured a lot of trans uh, cross-border investment flows into Africa and elsewhere around the world is that there's, there are few deals looking for the insurance in the first place. So what can get underwritten skews to the top of the pyramid as opposed to small and mid-market organizations. And so the entrepreneurs and others are crowded out of a lot of the um, investment guarantee opportunities that we have. Um, there, so, so that would be one, one model is to really lower the level and the threshold of underwriting some of these instruments um, and then leveraging more broad um, 
trade and investment relationships. Uh, the number of small businesses in the United States that could benefit from having market access across Sub-Saharan Africa and vice versa, that kind of inward flow, uh, just a small fraction of U.S. organizations trade internationally and leverage, um, whether it's institutions like the U.S. Export-Import Bank, um, formerly OPIC, and, and all of these other instruments skew to very large organizations as opposed to small organizations. And therefore, the default setting is to build based on existing models as opposed to build on innovative ones. And so I'd like to see more investment promotion uh, supported by the United States, but, but skewing towards small and mid-sized enterprises as well. Yes, and so maybe again, just to drill down further, uh, what would increase their market access? What do these smaller, what is it that we would do that would help? Is it an outreach program? Is it a specific instrument? What What is it? Yes, I think at one level, it's partly to broaden one, just the actual insurability of these and the bankability, a point that Dr. Moss raised a moment ago, the types of projects that get underwritten, that get U.S. Uh, government support through a range of institutions, um, to get banked and to, you know, to get the type of financial support really requires a lot of effort and it has a lot of cost and complexity baked into it. So I think there's an opportunity there to, you know, one, remove complexity from those instruments and systems and two, make them available to a broader pool of, of entrepreneurs and other developers and sponsors, one. The second thing, as a risk professional, we don't believe there's anything in the world as a bad risk. There's only mispriced risk. And one of the, the, the counterintuitive points about investing in Africa is that all of the worst things that can occur, expropriation, nationalization, all the rest, all of these bad events are insurable. So if you find a good deal, insure it and insure the downside. Therefore, you start to mobilize capital uh, in new ways. Okay. All right. Th thank you. And then, uh, Dr. Ngumbe, if you want to respond to that as well. Again, I am always looking for solutions, specifically legislative solutions. So, so I think, I think, yeah, as uh, agreeing, it's really if uh, the insurance sector, there can be underwriting of uh, the risks that go into it. And when you think about it, if you're trying to ensure farmers who are only uh, farming with less than one acre, clearly there may be not a clear business model for insurance, yet uh, if they start underwriting, then uh, we have uh, startups and innovators who are going to go in because they know that if the risks happen, they still are able to get. And we truly must step up to do this. And even though there may not even be a financial return, because clearly we know that these countries are only uh, emitting less than 4%, yet bearing the brunt. Every time I talk to the smallholder farmers, they do their best. They work extremely hard. We must step up to de-risk this uh, the bit so that we can allow companies to go without uh, thinking that going to make money because there's no money to make out of people that are poor and are only going to get poorer because of climate change. So time is urgent. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I saw Dr. Moss, you had your hand up. And please, uh, Ms. Welsh, after Dr. Moss, if you would like to comment. And yeah, so the bill. I'm glad you asked. You raised DFC. The Build Act gave DFC equity authority. That was probably the most important improvement over OPEC. But the way the equity is being scored in the budget is effectively uh, undercutting the ability to use equity. So Congress needs to work with the administration to solve the equity scoring issue. Uh, wait, or, that's very urgent. Wait, wait a minute. So what are you referring to in the president's budget, the way it was scored? Or no. what, what were you talking about? Which budget? No, the, so it's unresolved between Congress and OMB how equity will be scored. They're treating it like it's a grant, even though it's a long-term investment. And the British government, for example, when they, they score equity, they mark it to market. So they put a market price on what the value of the investment is. The way the U.S. is currently doing it, they're valuing those investments at zero. And so that means that that the DFC can only invest in equity up to the amount that is appropriated, like it was a grant. It's not a grant. It's an investment. So that that it's a technical thing, but it's actually devastating. 
So DFC can provide equity. Yes, but only up, I, I can't remember the exact number, but in the previous budget, it was 150 million. But that should be leveraged at least 20 times because of how of the scoring issue. So they can do tiny little things, but they can't do anything meaningful. Mr. Smith, do you want to work with me on that? I'm going to go to, to Ms. Welsh, but I'm I'm interested in following up on that. Maybe that's- yeah, Absolutely. Let's do it. Let's work together. Okay. Uh, Ms. Walsh, and then uh, I'll turn it over to uh, our ranking member. Thank you, Representative Bass. On the topic of insurance, this is incredibly important to food security because around the world, about 20% of those involved in agriculture are insured. When it comes to smallholder producers, only about 3% are insured. So actually we've identified this as, uh, as something that's, that's, um, that's necessary to improve agricultural productivity. Um, um, don't have you know any easy fixes to this. It's one of the things where I think that when, when it comes to this topic, people automatically will think to easier solutions like uh, improved agricultural inputs and you know increased access to water, for, um, et cetera. But it's often the the more complex and vexing challenges like increasing access to insurance, um, ensuring land land tenure, et cetera. Um, this is something that my my program at CSIS hopes to do work on and actually to issue policy recommendations on within the year. Um, so we'd be happy to, to to work with you on this specific topic. Um, and I hope you don't mind if I um, come to answer your question about legislative solutions as well. Um, beyond the top, great. Beyond the topic of insurance, um, the Global Food Security Act, which was passed originally in 2016, um, expires in 2023, so it's up for reauthorization very soon. And should Congress decide to reauthorize this, I would hope that um, that that um, we take the opportunity to update the language because the the language in the current global food security act reflects by and large reflects the last global food security crisis which took place in 2007 and 2008 um the 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 causes for that crisis were wholly different from the causes of the food insecurity crisis we see around the world and in africa today today the causes that we see are related to um covid 19 obviously climate change increasing impacts um conflict demographic shifts like urbanization. So I, I would hope that, um, that this new act um, reflects a, a new world and new challenges to, to global food security. Um, the global food security strategy is being uh, re redrafted right now. Um, that will be submitted in advance of the reauthorization of a reauthorization of the global food security act. Um, so I would hope that you know Congress would would press departments and agencies to take a new approach to food security. Um, my experience from being in the US government is that we often um, provided the answer before asking the question. The answer was the solution is agric agricultural productivity before asking what are the actual causes of food insecurity in a particular country? And those causes are very different country to country. So um, I, I, I look forward to Congress's scrutiny of the of the refreshed global food security strategy. And um, Representative Bass to take your question and um, your last question, which was about programmatic. I would hope um, to see ample funding for the global food security strategy and feed the future and continued high funding for the world food program. Thank you very much. And now let me ask um, my ranking member if he would like to engage in some questions. Thank you very much. And Ms. Welsh, thank you for your uh, additional insights on the Global Food Security Act. As you know, I was the house sponsor and absolutely committed to that cause. And thank you for your work uh, ongoing, including as director now. Um, I do. You had a very interesting comment in your testimony about continent-wide African countries rely on imports to meet approximately 85% of their food needs, making African countries vulnerable to food price shocks, economic, political, and cl uh, climate-related phenomena. Um, that's like a gee whiz fact that I think most people don't fully understand, and maybe you might want to elaborate how so much could be exported. You also imported, I should say. You also say they export uh, quite a lot as well, uh, and how that plays into uh, perhaps food insecurity. Uh, on the issue of Power Africa, and again, all of us in a bipartisan way were absolutely committed to that uh, initiative. Some 88 million people uh, since 2013 have had first time uh, electricity access. So it has some, some success. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, since you know, we are focusing on climate change, uh, the compatibility of Power Africa uh, and efforts to mitigate climate change, you know, how uh, compatible are they? Uh, Dr. Moss, you might want to speak to that as well. And then the issue of uh, you know climate change and political co conflict, as we uh, a few of you have already mentioned, and some of my colleagues as well. Uh, but specifically with respect to the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, where competition between Egypt and Ethiopia over water resources appears to be heightened because of environmental uh, fragility. Uh, you might want to speak to that as well. You know, if we 
get a better handle on all of this? Does that help mitigate that problem uh, as well? Because, uh, you know, I've had many meetings with both Egyptians and Ethiopians on that issue. Uh, and obviously part of it is, is access to water, major part. So uh, if you could speak to that uh, as well. Thank you very much, Representative Smith. On your topic on on your question on imports and exports, interesting to put this in the context of the United States, where actually we rely on imports to meet about 10 to 20 percent of our food needs in, in within our country. In Africa, it's reversed. Continent wide, it's reversed. Um, so I, I think it, it, you said the, the stat is about 85 percent of food um, that's needed in Africa is is imported. Um, one interesting nuance to that is that it's a handful of countries that are responsible for that trade deficit. So it's countries like Nigeria, Angola, Angola Somalia, um, that are responsible for that deficit. And when it comes to those countries, we can think about climate change um, and, and vulnerabilities from climate change in a different way. So when climate change um, decreases production or increases prices on the global market, it's countries like those that are that are most vulnerable. Most other countries across the African continent are actually next net exporters. And in that context, we can think about climate change in a different way, which is um, when climate change suppresses their yields, that leads to foregone profits, for example. So um, just different interplays between climate change and food insecurity, depending on the country we're talking about. Thank you for your questions. Dr. Ramos. Yeah, so, so you asked a good question if Power Africa is compatible with climate change. The answer is absolutely. Uh, the combination of climate change, urbanization, and rising incomes means that the, uh, uh, the unmet electricity demands in Africa is going to skyrocket. So they're going to need orders of magnitude more electricity to deal with all, all of those trends and really to create jobs in a more prosperous future and to play, play the, their rightful part in the global economy. We cannot have a energy apartheid or a, a two-tier global economy where half the world is uh, is connected watching Netflix and is on Zoom and, ha and half the world is left behind. We, we just can't have that. I do think that Congress can play an important role in Power Africa by encouraging the administration to set new metrics beyond the current metrics that they've done that could include climate change indicators, reliability indicators, but also Power Africa, while I'm a massive fan, it has been structurally underfunded from the beginning and a line item for Power Africa would help to secure that future. And we're, we're happy to provide some more details. My colleague, Katie Auth, uh, led a, an amazing group of all stars to come up with some recommendations for how we can take uh, Power Africa to the next level. And I'll share that with, uh, with your staffs. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much. I would just add, you know, one of the things that uh, I, we all work on in our own districts, municipal waste and, and the like, uh, and all of the best practices that could be gleaned by the Africa as it emerges economically, uh, so they don't repeat the mistakes that were made. I mean, I had the dubious distinction of having more national priority listing sites in my district for Superfund than any other district uh, in the country, uh, because toxic waste was just dumped. Uh, all of those lessons learned when it, when it comes to water, when it comes to power uh, and electricity. Uh, you know, the Africans, if we do this right and follow uh, the strategic plan laid out by Power Africa and other uh, initiatives, uh, make a huge difference in, in growing the environment, but doing it in a sane and, and environmentally sensitive way. So thank you all for your, your testimonies. And I yield back on the chair. And thank you, uh, Mr. Smith. I, I'm going to turn um, the hearing now over to the committee vice chair, uh, Representative Omar. Uh, but before I, I do, I just really want, this has just been an outstanding panel, really appreciate uh, all of your input and uh, just want to especially appreciate the notion that we should not impose the same standards on the African continent that we do on the United States and expect Africa to uh, not be involved in gas. <laughs> exploration or any of that. I really appreciated that. Uh, Representative Vice Chair Omar. Thank you, Chairwoman Bass. Um, I really do appreciate this conversation today, and I um, wanted to uh, sort of start my uh, questioning with Dr. Nagumbi. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, climate change driving force, um, force displacement. 
I think for a lot of people, they imagine that this is only when there is obvious causes and effect, uh, a drought or a hurricane or wildfires or something massive and traumatic causing people to flee. But I think to some extent, we can think of almost all refugees as climate refugees, people fleeing armed conflict, like in the Sahel or in the Horn are often fleeing bitter disputes over increasingly limited resources. Um, your, the story you told about your own family is another example. Sometimes there isn't one major event that displaces people. Sometimes it's the repeated withering of uh, crops every year and the unpredictability of the rain. Um, I don't know your family's plan, but I hear a lot of stories of people who have been farming the same lands for a generation who eventually decide that their only hope uh, is to move to the cities or to cross borders or to flee uh, in order to be able to feed themselves. How should we be understanding the various impacts of climate on forced displacement and migration, especially when we are trying to make policy to protect refugees and internally displaced people? Thank you, Representative uh, Omar. And that's a great question. Once again, yeah, displacement uh, is because of many, many uh, compounding uh, factors. And you talked about land. Many farmers have farmed for on that land, and now we know 65% of Africa's land is degraded. Degraded. Soils can no longer support the health of the crops that we uh, expect, and that means the agricultural sector can't thrive. And even when we put the inputs, we know science is clear that without healthy soils and microorganisms that live in the soil, even the most inputs that you put, then they got worse. What does that mean? And then you have also the access to land. And even when farmers are farming, these land title deeds are only up to the men. Women don't have access to the land that they're tilling, the land that they're working on. And then compounded by uh, droughts and uh, all these other uh, flooding, for example, unreliable uh, rains. And without a sense of hope, yes, people move. I've seen peers that moved to the cities. Kibera slum, for example, in Kenya, in my own country, Kenya, and the conditions are no longer better. Then, so we must take a really comprehensive approach to the issue of climate change. Because we know the factors that are triggering and, and this uh, conflict, are many. We must take a very, very comprehensive uh, approach that begins with the land, that begins with also uh, financial interventions that we also help families. When you've been living in abject poverty, even when you expect them to say, oh, here are the innovations, how are they going to even help themselves? So we must realize that we're also dealing with a population that has already been pushed in poverty. They can't afford even the uh, solutions we are proposing right now. And so I think it's important that as US or legislators make their laws, make the initiatives, having that first hand knowledge, we must listen to the Africans and work together, I think. And the solutions will come from an improved agricultural sector, energy. For example, Africa, this, I live in the Kenyan coast. Sun is there 365 days. We haven't harnessed sun. Yet, people lack the energy. That energy would power drip irrigation. It will power agriculture. So we must take a very broad and comprehensive approach. And no siloing of disciplines and uh, our different sectors. Thank you so much once again. Well, Hassanti, for um, that uh, um, you know eloquent uh, response to, to to my question. I think um, one thing stood out for me in in your response. It is important uh, for us to to recognize that Africans do have the solutions um, themselves to address uh, the the 
the the crises that are that are facing the continent and if given the opportunity and listen to um they themselves can can be the innovators uh, who are coming up with the solutions for um uh for for a better tomorrow for for the continent so so thank you all and I think with that, um, we will uh, adjourn our uh, committee hearing. Um, thank you all uh, to our panelists for your insightful um, uh, perspective uh, on this issue, the, the work that you are doing and the time that you have taken today um, to come and present and answer um, our, our questions. And um, super grateful to our chairwoman and the uh, committee members uh, who have participated. So thank you all, have a great afternoon. <laughs>